We'll uh, call our meeting to order. First item is roll call. Stay in. Mayor Skoog. Present. Vice Mayor Nye. She is here. Councilmember Mallory. Is absent this evening. Councilmember Anderson. Here. Councilmember Whiting. Here. Councilmember Marshall. Here. And Councilmember Grossman. I'm here too. Thank you. We have a quorum there. Number three, simple. I think we're going to make that last. <laughs> we'll start with number three, presentation, simple regional transportation plan update. Chris, you're up. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, hopefully I can figure out this little controller. Norm gave me training before, so hopefully we're good. Um, Mayor, Council, Chris Bridges, I'm the administrator for Central Yavapai MPO, and here to just give you an update on a recently completed regional transportation plan uh, for the year 2040. Uh, a little bit of background on the plan. Uh, as an MPO, federal re legislation requires us to uh, update this every five years, and the reason you do so is exactly what we just went through. Our first study that we did was completed in 2006. Uh, 2006 was a very different time uh, than, than we're in right now. <clears throat> we were able to put off a little bit. We uh, partnered with the Federal Highway Administration and ADOT to say if we could wait, get all of the general plan data from the cities and towns and the county, and then we could be able to incorporate that into our new study. So we were able to, with all of this new information, through, this, through everybody sharing, uh, adjust our loop, uh, traffic po projections and uh, reevaluate what our future priorities may be for the regional system. And in general, uh, we did partner very well with the uh, state of Arizona, ADOT. Uh, they saved us quite a, a big chunk of change, about $100,000, by uh, allowing us to um, give them our information in exchange they put it into the statewide model. So our information is now included in the ADOT statewide model that includes freight, cars, uh, bike ped, all this other stuff. And <clears throat> with all the, the cities and town information for your updated general plans, it all came together quite well. A uh, study area actually goes outside of the simple planning boundary. Um, we took it out all the way to I-17, incorporating 169, 69 on the bottom right there, all the way up to Paulden and the northern reaches, reaches of uh, Williamson Valley. And I know you won't really be able to read these slides, but uh, just to show you existing populations on the left, the forecasted populations on the right, and to give you an example of the changes from 2006 to this year, uh, our original population projection for the year 2030 in that 2006 study was over 440,000 people in the Simpo area. We've now reduced that down to about 212,000 people for the year 2040. So being able to account for the decrease in building permits and all the activity, uh, we're able to reel that back down and get a, a more reasonable number. We also took information from your general plans and incorporated those and showed the existing employment areas as well as the forecasted employment. And what you really see is a bigger uh, draw on the 89A corridor, everything from the airport all the way over towards, towards viewpoint uh, drive area. So we came out with three different levels of recommendations. Uh, these three here, the State Route 89A and 89 traffic interchange, as well as the 69, 169 intersection and 89A traffic interchanges to look at all of them, was an immediate short-term cost-effective way to look at some of the improvements that we might need to have right away. And I'll, I'll jump in on the first one there, the State Route 89A and 89 in, uh, traffic interchange. We have a high volume of traffic coming down from Chino Valley, um, specifically in the morning. There's dual left-hand turn lanes that go underneath the bridge at 89A, and the folks that are making a left to go to Prescott Valley in the mornings to come to work, or whatever it is they're doing, uh, are not using both of those turn lanes because 
the right lane dead ends and takes you over to Larry Caldwell Drive and you end up at a stop sign and then have to take another ramp down. So people are not utilizing the full capacity of that. And the, the consultant was able to look at this and say, you might want to have dual on-ramps to the freeway, or maybe you work out a half diamond intersection where both those lanes are going up to Larry Caldwell. You put a roundabout or something, and then they all go back onto the highway. So there's other alternatives to be able to increase the capacity through that intersection. The next step was the, the short range 2025 projections. And the ones that are listed on here, I'll turn this so I can see it, are uh, State Route 69, various locations widening out to six lanes. I know you're very well here uh, in the town of Prescott Valley. There's portions of 69 that have three lanes on one side, two on the other. Some are just two, some are all the way across, and trying to get those consistencies all the way through to increase capacity and safety. Um, the second one on there was installing traffic interchange at 89A and Robert Road. Uh, Glassford Hill Road was also uh, recommended to be widened full length all the way up to 89A to six lanes. And then um, Stone Ridge Drive would be a connector that would pull up into the new uh, developments on the northwest side of Prescott Valley should those come in. 2040 uh, is, was kind of a big change for us. We had previously shown a Great Western extension, Chino extension, a connection from Fain Road over to 169. With the reduction in population growth and the change in uh, activity areas, the volumes on those uh, went down significantly. So we've pushed those out a little bit further, but still focused on, on, on other needs, still looking at 89A is going to need to have more capacity. Um, still having additional capacity on 89 up through uh, going to Chino and other ones in the area, uh, such as uh, 69 again, adding additional lanes on 169, more specifically getting up the hill as you're going towards uh, MDI Rock uh, in that area to go over towards the Verde Valley. And then the beyond 2040 are the ones that we didn't want to lose sight of what these uh, corridor studies would possibly be or new routes would possibly be and we still want to keep them in the plan but recognizing that they're not showing the projected volumes that we need at this time or they might just not be feasible right now so um, with that I'll close and try to answer any questions but I you know I do want to thank Norm was a huge part of this study and all of the town staff, Richard Parker and everybody providing all their information. Uh, and uh, we're very happy with the study. We did give, give Norm a, a large printed out paper copy should you want to read through a thing about eight inches thick. So. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike, you had a question? Yeah, I would. I just had a question. That is, uh, are you putting together some sort of funding and payout? Uh, uh, I guess plan relative to implementation. Is that soon to come or not necessarily? Well, that's been the great mystery, <laughs> right? Um, as we've seen recently, there have been numerous states going out and increasing gasoline tax, sales tax, and, and the like. And, and uh, Arizona, we have not taken that step forward yet. Uh, that actually puts Arizona 45th in the nation in transportation revenue. So we were higher and we keep dropping. Um, there's been some you know, various discussions about is it going to be a state level thing, is it going to come from the legislature, is there going to be a citizen driven initiative, um, what's going to happen and we're not positive. Uh, we did talk with the Maricopa South Association of Governments and they're looking at from what their polling said that taxpayers are looking more like 2018, they might be more willing to support uh, an increase in their uh, RTA, Regional Transportation Authority. So I'm not sure the voters are quite there yet in Arizona, but it's something that we need. Other questions? Laura? Thank you, Chris, for being here today. Um, I'm assuming that everything is flexible because it isn't based just on need, it's based on available funding, and of course we know what that's been like. Uh, so if that got reduced, it would affect it. But if it got increased, and I'm being real positive here, 
would we be able to make changes and bring improvements forward at earlier dates? Right. So the improvements or recommendations that are in here are kind of in blocks. Right. But, you know, if there's an opportunity that, say, you know, you're able to get some safety funds and that right. can accelerate a project up, uh, then we can definitely look at that. And we are very flexible. You know, it is a plan. It's not set in concrete. We're able to move around and adjust accordingly. And, and we've been very successful doing that. So, uh, and, you know, we're, we're on a, a turn lane budget <laughs> and have much higher needs than turn lanes. Thanks, Chris. Sure. Stephen? I, I had a question that I've been asked like multiple times from people. Um, I saw that the recommendation was to make 69 six lanes. Um, other people have asked me, why not just put a frontage road and, and do it that way and get rid of all of the, the red lights? The frontage road concept through Diamond Valley area would be tricky. It's pretty tight in there. Um, adding the additional lane would be easier uh, I do understand what you're talking about. You know, there are portions of the roadway where you could potentially look at that. You know, the, the, the real benefit Prescott Valley has is that you do have those frontage roads that were planned out ahead of time. Um, the Diamond Valley area has got so much terrain, I'm not sure you could get them to work through there. Okay. Other questions, Marty? Yeah, uh, the plan looks pretty good, but as you widen lanes, uh, will you also be changing any of the speed limits? Well, that's up to eight uh, on the state routes and then the local jurisdictions on their own roads. Cool. But I will tell you, it, in the instance of if you add a median barrier on the state route, you can't have over 45 mile per hour speed limit, which is, you know, between here and, and Diamond Valley going towards Costco and Prescott, that's why the speed limit dropped there. So there are factors engineering-wise that, that play into it. Other questions? Anything else, Chris? I'm good. Um, I'm always available. If you have any questions, p please feel free to let me know or get a hold of Norm, and he'll let me know, and I'd be happy to come back anytime. Good. Well, we sure appreciate that. Great. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Good job. Okay, we'll move on to number four, discussion regarding NAC NACOG transit voucher system. Norm, it says to get, get, a, get a hold of you anytime. Midnight. <laughs> Between two and four, Norm. Yes, Mayor, we've got quite a few items up. This is the time of year of Public Works. We do get to renew some of our, our quite a few of our outsourced services materials. But this first one I'm going to talk to you tonight is the NACOG uh, transit voucher system. And uh, I think Council is well aware of this system. It works very, very well uh, to serve a particular portion of our community that needs uh, the rights and they qualify through NACOG. I think the big success and the dedication has been uh, by you, Council. I get a lot of the thank yous about running the program, and I say, well, that's... Um, you know, there's been a lot of momentum, and it's easily done through NACOG. But I think the biggest thank you goes to Council because you've had a commitment to continue to fund this transit voucher program, even though the historic funding source, as you may recall, it's been four years now, when typically we had LTAF two funds come from the state. We typically had a 25% match. Well, I uh, always use the analogy. They took that funding bucket completely away. It's no more. And it's been Council's commitment to continue to fund this, and I know it's gone for a great need. So I will uh, talk a few of the... Highlights, and then, uh, as always, uh, Vicki Mastriani, uh, who's the fiscal officer for NACOG, she's uh, responsible for a lot of this program, so she can talk about some of the particulars, and I'll give you some of the highlights. So uh, with that, this is the 16th year that we've had this in the town, and, of course, the funding level, as you can see from the overhead, has been consistent at $50,000 a year, and as you see, there is a zero in the LTAF two contribution that we used to enjoy in order to provide rides for people. So it's been a commitment of council to keep that funding level at, at the 50,000 level. And keep in mind, the beauty of uh, transit, it builds over time. Uh, professionals that know a lot about transit say when you have a consistent program, that's really what works time after time. People uh, grow to depend on this or know that resource is there. So keeping at the same funding level is uh, very, very, very big uh, in order to continue on with the, the service. Uh, this is a particular uh, printout that we get. Uh, this is up to date. We pay quarterly for the rides to NACOG. Uh, they do take a 50% um, uh, fee in order to administer the program. But here is some of the rides, and you can see some of the breakouts there. Maybe a little hard to read, but you can see the number of about 120 
people get served and the rise. I know Vic can go into that a little more. And if you look, and below is um, Councilman Whiting brought this up a few years ago in that there is actually who's providing the rides. So it's interesting there to see who competes. And I understand too, they uh, do offer some discounts to this particular ridership through their own company. So you can see some of the ridership there and what vendors actually provide that service. So of course we're up through March and of course at the end of June here, we will um, renew or be done with this program. And what we're asking you for is renew the program, of course, for this new budget year starting July 1st. And as always, we'd like to make sure that information is always readily available to the um, community out there that would want these vouchers. And what's important to note is this is uh, an old screenshot from the website, but with our new website, we will make sure that that gets in an easily identifiable area so any particular individual looking for this service can find it on our website. And equally, even hard copy brochures we developed a couple years ago, uh, checked in with Vicki, and they've got lots of them out and about in uh, kiosks to where people that would desire this service could find it and get the information they need and either call or get on the website to find out more about the program. With that, can I ask any questions you have now or we can bring Vicki up and she can talk about more of the particulars of this year's program. Questions, anyone? Uh, my, uh, Mike? Yeah, I just had a, a couple questions. I was just curious again about the providers. I noticed I think Coca Pelli is a relatively newer uh, provider and I'm just wondering is there anything uh, in terms of what's attractive to the uh, people who use those over one provider over another or is it just pretty much location or availability just kind of curious I don't know maybe Vicki can answer I've never talked to Coca Pelli directly but it might be all of the above um, them pursuing business location yeah. and right. just having a you know particular desire to uh, compete and take a significant market share so to speak of this particular because I think this is their first year is it not that we've seen them no they've been in business about three because they're, they're taking a larger share it looks like of the number of writers. No, I was just kind of curious. You're absolutely right. Uh, Coca Pelli has been getting the, the larger the share of the, of the ridership. And I think there's a couple of reasons why. Um, I've seen their, their uh, cars around town, and they have us on the side of the car, NACOG um, vouchers and their phone numbers. So they really do market this service. And uh, of course, with any, uh, with all of our providers, we do provide our recipients a list of the different providers that we are contracted with, what their rates are, different kinds of services they provide, and of course, the recipient is going to make that decision about who they're going to choose. And I, I have to say that um, I don't have a formal presentation. You're all familiar with the voucher program, and we just really are so grateful that Prescott Valley has supported it all these years. Um, there is a huge need. Uh, the, the ridership is actually from last year to this year, same time period, um, July through April, is up 16%. And you would wonder, how could we do that with the same amount of money? Well, part of it is that the residents of Prescott Valley, are, I think, are making better choices about who they get their rides from, uh, making sure that they're looking at those rates um, and making those decisions um, accordingly. And also, we, we've made strong effort to really trim back any way that we could on our administrative costs so that we could put more money into the program. And so we've, we've been pretty successful with that this past year. And um, rather than, we've just, you know, just done our part so that we could get more out there. We do look at our um, funds, available funds, every month. Before we put together our voucher packets, everybody calls in on the 20th of every month and right now our packet um, that we're able to deliver, which is $40 worth of vouchers, and of course there is a $2 copay, and of course the vouchers are gonna pay for whatever that rate is that the provider is charging. So, um, and of course, like Norm said, some of the providers do give uh, discounts, and uh, I think um, some of our providers do give their drivers some discretion with how they give those discounts. And so it's, it's really a fabulous um, service that is a coordinated effort by a lot of people to serve um, people in Prescott Valley with their transportation needs. Um, we um, look at that funding every month. And if we feel like that we're a little bit of the head of the game because we give out the vouchers, they don't all come back to us. And so we, through the year, 
Uh, I think at your suggestion, Mr. Whiting, that we did find a way to, um, I had uh, the lady who was administrating this, doing the clerical side of it, she said, I'll do the extra work. And so she started uh, numbering all those voucher packets as they went out. And so when they came back in, she could cross-reference it to the recipient. To We wanted to see whether there was any kind of a trend of people receiving vouchers and then just consistently not using them. And we didn't identify anything like that. So that made us feel good that it wasn't uh, a trend that we needed to be concerned about. Um, so we look at that and if we feel like that we need to bump up the available uh, vouchers for the coming month, then we'll do that. So I had this discussion with uh, my uh, assistant every month. She'll come to me about this time and she say, okay, how many are we going to have for July? And how many are we going to have? And so I'll go back and I'll look at the funding and I'll determine, you know, what we can afford to do. And so uh, we're, we're going up and down all the time, but we're very happy when we can do more. And um, so that's, that's our goal. And um, so as I said, we've had a 16% increase in ridership. It's still a little bit less than half of what people tell us they need to have. When they do call in on the 20th, we ask them, you know, how many rides do you think you're going to need next month? And they'll tell us. We ask them what they're going to need them for. And so we record all this data. We keep track of it all. And, of course, that's reflected in some of the reports that you get. Um, and so we, we have a pretty good idea of what people's needs are as opposed to what they're actually receiving. And uh, so it, it is a continuing service that is very necessary. Um, we did recognize about, about midway, about towards the end of 2014, and we had some phone calls from a few people here who were not getting served. They were getting their vouchers, but they couldn't find anybody who would carry them anyplace. And uh, we were able to find, and it was you know, bariatric transfers is what we were looking at, somebody who needed special um, uh, lifts in order to you know, get transferred to the grocery store or wherever they needed to go. So we were able to uh, find a, a, a provider in the area who was willing to contract with us to provide that service. So that we added that to our provider list, published it, made sure everybody knew about it. And uh, you don't see it on your list right there, but I think there are going to be times where we're going to see them pop up, where those services are going to be uh, available to the people who need them. So that's, that's mainly what, what we have going on. It's a, it's a great program, um, and we're very happy to be able to provide it to the residents of Prescott Valley. And with your support, we're just very, very grateful for that. Any questions, anyone? Anything else? Well, I did want to mention, you know, Nora mentioned the, the website. Uh, we do, on our NACOG homepage, we do have a link right there on the homepage that takes them right to the information for um, the Prescott Valley Voucher Program. And um, I think the link that we have has probably not been updated, but we're working on it. I made sure our webmaster up in Flagstaff knew about it, so hopefully that will get taken care of very soon. But we put it on the home page, and I was very happy that we were able to do that. Good. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Anything else? That's it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. It. Keep up the good work. Okay, we move on then to number five, discussion regarding the annual materials contra contract. Norm, it looks like your uh, vendors were good to you this year. Yes, they were, Mayor, and that's really uh, for, for the benefit of the Council. This is the annual uh, materials contracts. We order all kinds of different materials throughout the year in order to maintain our streets. And I think the biggest thing I want to focus on is, you know, competition and, of course, cost effectiveness. We do this every year for the commodities we buy in street maintenance. And what's important to note is we watch that very close. Um, at times, we have a very good relationship with some of our local material suppliers, but we do need to make sure that they keep a sharp pencil, so to speak, and stay competitive. So we've been real happy. Um, if you would, Mayor, I'd like to just go over some of the highlights here just to point out the Council yearly what we've done. But I think the first one would be roadway materials. You can see those are the cold mix we use to patch pout holes in the uh, winter time when hot mix is not available. So we spend about $50,000 a year there. Of course, you see that uh, last year we had CMEX um, was a material supplier. But once again, asphalt paving supply has been very competitive and very, very uh, easy to work with and a very, uh, very valued by our streets department for the service to provide. Like, likewise, the hot mix, you've been seeing our crews out patching some of the roads in advance at Chip Seal. Basically, all that is is, yes, uh, for uh, $65 a ton, we back a truck up, they make it for us, and we go out and 
and hot patch, which is a better, more permanent patch at times when you can do it that methodology. So as I mentioned, we spend up to $200,000 a year uh, truckload by truckload repairing our streets. So a very, very good price that, that we get to enjoy. And the convenience, obviously, is uh, we only buy when we need it. And of course, this is the high time with being warm. We're doing lots of patching. Comment with on that right now? No? OK. And likewise, uh, we do uh, some of the edge shoulder patching. We spend about $15,000 a year just making sure that we back up to make sure we don't have any dangerous edges on roads. Um, next one, asphalt paving. Good example of that one is uh, that's actually an outsourced service. They come with a paver machine to do significant patches. I think the most visible one this year was uh, Lake Valley right in front of Pathway by the Albertsons. We had a significant patch in there that kind of blew up over <laughs> a short period of time. We contracted out for that. And uh, actually, that's what makes it most effective effective. They've got the paving machines and the experienced crews that come out, took care of that readily. In fact, I think it was, uh, we were done, I think, in July, uh, real quick with that particular patch. So uh, as, um, actually, here's your competition for you, failed to mention, so, uh, specialty paving and grading um, beat out asphalt paving supplies. So there's your competition. We'll have a new contractor next year doing that same service. So they will probably buy their mix of, from one of the local suppliers, but that's up to the market. So uh, that's the price they gave us, and uh, we got to change in vendor. Likewise, the annual street and part concrete, um, as you see here, asphalt paving supply is the, is the low. And just you know, rolling back the clock to the competition last year, we had three bidders last year. But once again, asphalt paving supply is the low bid. And they do a great job for us repairing a curb and sidewalk. You know, When we get those small repairs, they do a good job. We spend anywhere from thirty to $40,000 a year repairing curbs and sidewalk panels that break. Or you know, accidents, too, we do have. Um, damage to the public right-of-way at times uh, due to accidents, and that's what repairs a lot of them, so we outsource that. Culverts, pretty simply, that's for drainage. Interesting thing was we only had one bid last year, and that was from Arizona Culvert, and uh, this year, uh, change in vendors, contact competed, and uh, we'll have a new vendor there. So we spent about 15000 to 20000 a year on, on culverts. Uh, solid waste disposal may be the biggest um, competition we're seeing this year, and um, who's in the game? Last year we had Waste Management and Patriot, only two bidders, and lo and behold, this year you see best pick disposal, um, very good to bid. Of course, we asked them, it seems a very advantageous price. And it says, we can do it for that. We want your business. So very good example of yearly, we look at the competition. We tune up some of the service. I know a couple of our dumpsters here, we've been seeing some um, increased service here due to use of the Civic Center and the library. So you know, we'll give it an extra day a week or something. But we tune up the contract. And uh, here you are. Um, very good competition, and Best Pick will be the new vendor for this coming year. And of course, portable toilets is uh, one that we don't particularly use in public works, but it is used at special events. So uh, we do bid that out and use it at our special event um, for the public to use. <laughs> so um, with that, um, as you can see on, on the overhead up here, here is the low particular vendors. And I uh, always like to point out to council what's very um, easy on staff and uh, contracts and the continuity we see from budget year uh, ending June 30th is our budget's done. Uh, we've done all the work. We've talked early. And we'll actually be able to hit the ground running. We actually can have these services and a seamless service. And I want to always point that out with council. We get the budget done in time. And this makes it a seamless approach that it's a new world for new monies and budget, but really all the service we get to enjoy, even with new vendors, they'll be ready to hit the ground running July 1st and uh, continue to, uh, you know, seamless service. Happy to answer any questions the council may have about each individual service, if I could. Questions, anyone? I think, yeah, it feels like you've done a great job doing it. Yeah, I mean, and thank you for letting me go through each one, because I do like to point out the tangibles in the field of where good competition, um, good vendors providing us uh, good materials out there that we're able to use as we need them, and uh, uh, you know, very, very beneficial for the street maintenance we do in order to have, especially the local supplier of asphalt pavement supply and some of their um, expertise and some of the contracting they do to uh, maintain our rights of way. With that, Mayor, I would ask that I come back next week and we award these contracts and um, That's move okay, forward. That's okay, I hope, everyone. No, uh, Larry? Yep, yeah, if I could uh, congratulate uh, Norm on 10 years uh, with the town. And it was 10 years ago right now that Norm did his first uh, council presentation 
um, and Norm was uh, a little nervous. Uh, he'd never been in front of you guys before. He never got over it either. <laughs> and, uh, and and the uh, the uh, the issue that uh, he had in front of him was the renewal of the porta potty contract, and he rather uh, mightily struggled with that issue. And it's really nice to see that after ten years of seasoning, he can just whip right through that issue. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Any, uh, I remember your comment about forest service restrooms, outhouses. Any other comments, He's anyone? Still <laughs> the pleasure still be here after 10 years, too, okay. Council. It's a lot of fun. If there's no uh, questions, we'll move on then to number five, uh, six, I'm sorry. Six. Discussion regarding the annual uh, service contracts. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Council. This one's similar to the last item. Uh, this is an annual renewed, um, but this is actually the contractors that come work for us. And uh, what's important to uh, show again is um, these are the outsourced vendors that we have longstanding uh, contracts that, they're, uh, we, that we get to renew every year. Aggregately, of all um, five of these particular contracts, adds up to about three-quarters of a million dollars of services that we do in a year. What I do like to point is uh, very similar to competition and cost-effectiveness. We do bid these out. Uh, every few years uh, to make sure that the particular uh, contractors we use are the sharpest and doing the best service. Uh, what's very nice to report is all of our particular vendors for the service you see here have been long-standing uh, contractors. They do a great job. Um, we don't have to manage them as much and they know what, what to do. I think one of the more important things to point out by outsourcing is what we particularly save in just staffing that we'd have to have here at the town. Um, I know there's been a lot of uh, things in the news lately about having staff and some of the particular challenge you have with retirement and benefits and the like. Um, by significant outsourcing and just managing that, we don't have that particular challenge. And um, once again, we stay uh, very attentive to what the market actually bears to what that cost of that service is. And I think that competition, uh, our particular contractors very much enjoy contracts with us because of um, we manage them well and uh, they know what to expect. I think the biggest thing I want to report of all these particular vendors, each one of them, uh, agreed to no service increase this year. They would like to renew their contract at 0% increase. So uh, some of these are very big uh, contracts, but um, they feel like we've got a good working relationship and let's just do it again. They've been real happy with uh, the payment for the service they've been providing. And uh, biggest thing to point out too, these are the specialists that um, they know the business well. Uh, you know, looking at uh, particular uh, landscaping is one of the ones here first up. Um, you know, we've got an arborist and those guys really know landscaping and you know, they really have a, it's a quite a large contract, about 238000 a year. And uh, they do not only maintain in all of the rights of way, but they also, parks is a significant part of that with mowing of the grass in some of the parks. So yes, parks does some of the mowing, but keep in mind there's a significant part that's outsourced that uh, we go out and have the private vendor go out and mow the grass for us so, in some of the parks. So this is shared with parks. And likewise, I point out too, some of the weed kill that we do to keep some of the rights of ways clear of weeds. Uh, that's a big part of this particular contract too. So um, those are the highlights. If I can talk about each, uh, some of them, fuel services, uh, we've been enjoying a good relationship with Bennett. Council may have noticed in the last year with the contract we've had, they've upgraded their station significantly off of Glassford. So uh, I know they appreciate the volume of, of um, particular service they provide and, and fuel purchase. So that's about $250,000 a year. Uh, landscape servers already covered. Street striping. There's a very good example of outsourcing. We spend anywhere from fifty to seventy-five thousand a year of street striping, but we don't have that big truck sitting in our yard. It takes about three weeks to stripe the town. We do it typically once a year on some of our major arterials a couple times. But uh, they're the experts at making sure that line's straight, and um, we enjoyed a, a great um, relationship. And, and once again, a local vendor here. Traffic safety is, is, is a local contractor, and. Uh, they come and strike force and do a very good job. Street sweeping, very similar. There's good competition there. We spend about $35,000 a year on street sweeping, but once again, not a street sweeper in the inventory. Uh, it takes them two to three weeks, and they do that four times a year. And uh, they do a good job, as we say, and don't have to add to staff. Uh, janitorial may be the um, other example, too, of uh, this particular building and police and PD. Um, they clean those buildings for us, and that's about 125000 a year. But I know uh, Greg's had the contract for longer than I've been here, and it's renewed, of course, but uh, just last year we went and rebid that contract, and he was still the low. We went out and had, I think, five bidders. So we'd like to renew again uh, this year with Clean Team. Uh, they 
do, do a good job. And uh, they're the specialists at the game. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about each particular service or area of what we're doing. Yeah, just curious again, uh, curious about the street sweeping. You say that's done four times a year. Is that is is it certain areas that you do that, or is it pretty much curbed areas? Is is where that's at. Only we we mow the non-curbed areas. So some of the newer subdivisions with concrete curbs. So we do that four times a year. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Other questions on the uh, fuel? I, I've not remembering how you work on that. Now it's very volatile. It changes sometimes week to week. It can, and what it is is purchased upon the Opus Index, if I can explain it clearly. And of course, they get a markup that they've bid in order to provide the administration and service and the transport. So there is an index that they use weekly that they index the fuel prices to. So with the volatile fuel prices, uh, it's based upon a volume sale. Okay, good. Other questions, anyone? Opus is the price we end up paying as the uh, petroleum comes out of the pipeline down in Phoenix, and it's it's it, as Norm is saying, it's a it's an index uh, that fluctuates for, uh, fairly frequently, but it's a, a pretty low price. And then I think you're paying is it ten cents, fifteen eight, cents a gallon, eight. eight cents a gallon for the administration of it, uh, the, all of the billing that goes on and the, the machines over there to your swipe cards and everything else, but uh, we get a good, pretty good price. Good. You know, and on the fuel, that's where technology has really helped. I know um, one thing with the fuel cards, we're very specific that goes to a vehicle. That way you know that you have to put in the mileage correctly because it knows, hey, if you're putting in gas and you didn't drive enough miles or conversely or use a different car in a different vehicle, it's going to say it's not going to sell it to you. And that's where we can uh, make sure we audit the system that we don't get particularly any loss or uh, you know, mismanagement or misuse of any particular fuel. So the fuel cards are very important, very specific. And what's nice is, uh, you know, in, in public works, when uh, Nicole, our ad admin assistant, she's able to look at all those particular uh, spreadsheets, and we can audit it every month to make sure, and of course, charge the department accordingly, make sure the fuel is charged. But really, it's, it makes it easy to do an audit. And it's, of course, there's automatic triggers that if something looks a little haywire, it'll tell you right away. It's odd sometimes that. You know, sometimes it, the cars do get mixed up, and right away it shuts it down. They give us a call and say, hey, how come it won't work? And we find out what went wrong and uh, get them back on track. So technology really works well to make sure we uh, uh, manage the particular expenditure. So you're telling me when I gas up um, on miscellaneous, I've always wanted to do something wild, so I should not? <laughs> Well, you, you might find yourself there at the machine a little longer. So, um, no, but but I know the card read. Um, that's very much an inter, um, integral part of the fuel service. Not only just pumping the gas, but making sure we manage and un understand uh, that expenditure. Because if you spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you want to make sure that is going to lane miles in a town vehicle. Well, I particularly appreciated when they put the new technology there because that was a nightmare until they made that change. But it's extremely efficient. It, it accepts the card on the first reading, and that was not the case before. So kudos for that improvement. Any other questions, comments? Anything else, Norm? No, Mayor. Likewise, the last item, I'd like to bring this back to you next week, get the contracts awarded, and we'll move into July 1st and do more business. I think we're ready for it. Numbers, we'll move on to number seven. Presentation, Public Works five-year operational projections. Yes, sir. Uh, equal to several of my uh, peer directors, uh, the Public Works Department, I've prepared a five-year operational plan. Uh, very similar, you've had presentations the last a few work studies. So tonight I am going to talk to you about Public Works and uh, what I believe it really is um, in the plans for the next five years. I do want to point out Public Works, a lot of our focus can be on streets. It's a lot of our expenditure and a lot of our particular work plan. But I always like to point out that the stormwater management, which is uh, you know maintaining the storm drain system and drainage, um, comes to the forefront usually about every August when we get our summer storms or late July. But that's something we manage year long. And of course, I always like to point that out because we do get grant funding um, throughout the year that we build projects with. So always have those different buckets of money. So stormwater management, uh, new infrastructure development is a department. That's really making sure that public infrastructure, I'm talking new subdivisions or anything new we build. Of course, that's the engineering division and the inspection, but make sure the infrastructure we have that we accept is um, up to standard and uh, not particularly an operational um, challenge with, with funding. So uh, that's a, an important department. Uh, likewise, GIS, um, you know, uh, Larry Prentice is a department of one right now, 
and he supports all the departments. You've seen all the color maps that we have and actually supporting uh, parks and recreation, even police department I know quite often. Um, graphing information system very much an integral part with technology of um, making things look real simple when you explain things by a map and the graphing information system is a, a very integral part of, in, in housed and public works but touches all the departments um, quite often. Uh, once again facilities management we do have a, you know th three particular members there manage these buildings to keep them up kept and make sure we manage the janitorial contract we talked in the last item so uh, facility is a big part of, of our service to residents here through our for our buildings that we have here at the town and of course fleet management we have in a neighborhood around 200 uh, small vehicles in addition to around 30 in the public works department so uh, there's once again another outsource it's a particular division of one and one administrative assistant that manages the whole fleet so they manage that for everyone so fleet management very much a, a department in public works but probably not as much focus as some of the street maintenance which uh, probably leads me most into street maintenance is probably where I see the biggest challenge we have uh, operationally. It uh, takes most of the funding, but I think um, operationally over the next five years, what the biggest challenge is, and of course if you look at the uh, particular um, five-year plan that I prepared, we have 260 miles of, of roadways in Prescott Valley, but the biggest challenge we have is no one's indexed, I'll go over it for you, Council, the indexed how we gain that funding since 1993. The same 18 cents a gallon we had in 1993 is the flat rate it's been at the pump. We've had our ups and downs in cyclic um, you know, economy we've had, but still it hasn't been indexed. Lots happened since 93, ups, downs, and in-betweens. But if you don't index a flat tax, um, quite frankly, we don't have the same buying power at all that we had in um, 1993 in order to maintain roads, which of course the HERF funding, Highway User Revenue Fund at the pump is what we use to maintain roads. It's continued to dwindle. You've heard me make presentations over the last several years. I think we're getting close to that cliff. We've starving some of our maintenance. We do put money into maintenance, but it's uh, really um, not to the level that I believe we need to have for good mobility on our streets and a good, good quality streets. So as I mentioned, 1993 is not the same. I've listened to professionals that run the numbers and said, you know, that's, that would typically have to be 41 cents in today's if you just stayed the same. And that's nowhere near what it takes what we did in 1993. I think we're falling behind. Uh, what I've pointed out there was you've seen the chip seal that I brought to you here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were spending in a neighborhood, and we spend, you know, we understand the downturn, but we were spending around half a million dollars a year. Really, we need to spend about a million dollars a year to maintain to that level of five years of a chip seal cycle. And I think council saw uh, this year the new contract we're going to award is about 1.2 million. But uh, that gets us catching back up, but we're at about an eight-and-a-half-year cycle. So we need a million dollars a year to maintain our roads with chip seals, which is a good maintenance treatment. But um, we need to catch up a little bit. So a million dollars more a year would, I think, catch us up to where we want to be in that five years. And not all at once. It would be incrementally done, and I think we could catch back up and raise our service level of our existing streets. Uh, likewise, we haven't been able to spend any money on what I would call major maintenance treatments. Pavements typically are a life cycle of about 20 years. They do wear out. You need to rehab them. The term out there is a mill and fill and overlay, and we haven't done those in the last several years. Just in the fact we've been just trying to maintain what we can, but we have done no real big structure redevelopment. That does degrade over time. Some of our particular roads that I point out to you start to get seen the rutting. Too much weight, too much traffic. They start to rut, and that just tells you the distress that they can see. So likewise, over the next five years in a life cycle, I would make the recommendation with growth that we need to see about you know, three-quarters of a million dollars in order to maintain some of our materials. I will qualify, as, as the report says, the one-third cent sales taxes help that a lot because obviously those are arterial collectors. What we do with a small two-lane road with a pavement section that wasn't enough to sustain the traffic, the widening does help, and that is a good funding source, so that helps uh, quite a bit, but still isn't enough really to catch the other roadways other than the four roadways. I think Council's aware of a viewpoint. Lakeshore, Navajo, and Robert are recipients of that particular funding of widening and uh, better pavement structural section. So that's roadway um, maintenance. The other thing I think capital needs, what's important is, uh, of course, I know Kim and Ryan worked real hard on this development impact fee. There is a particular chart that's been attached that discusses this is actually an excerpt from that particular study. Hard to read in the small numbers, but what it really shows is we anticipate if housing goes at a particular pace, we anticipate with that basically 3.8% growth rate, 
we'll be accumulating about $1.4 million a year in development impact fees to put towards um, whatever impact we see for uh, what you would call um, any widenings or enhancements to the system. A good example, I'd like to point out the council on next year's budget has the long look signal is actually development impact fees, a separate bucket of money, but this particular fee goes directly towards that. That project has been identified in addition to some of the other roadways in Prescott Valley where that development and impact has shown from engineering study where that money could be spent and tell the development community you're paying your fair share for the expansion needed for growth pace for growth. So I would anticipate, uh, didn't want to leave that out, but that particular uh, 1.4 million went on top of the other funding sources to really just keep up with a good mobility and service level uh, that I think our residents would like to anticipate and expect for uh, their, their trips that they, they, they generate. Moving back, um, always we just talked a lot about outsourcing. Uh, Public Works will continue to outsource significantly and keep our staffing to a minimum and manage a lot of these particular contracts. So we would uh, outsource at the particular same rate of increase and just add more service to some of our service contracts. We do that routinely. But we would see a particular in-house staffing needs for some of the various departments that I mentioned over time if we see this continued growth rate in order to manage that particular resource or those outsourced contracts. So you can see uh, some of the particular, um, we talked about GIS um, with the support to other departments. We really feel like another, some support there, another staff member would really help the service to residents and, uh, you know, the economies of scale you can see with using technology. Likewise, um, some of the other in uh, probably will need an inspector if we see the subdivisions continue. Um, some of the inspection that we um, actually through attrition, we would like to rebuild that in order to make sure the public infrastructure built, we would be looking at another inspector. And likewise, some of the uh, fleet, fleet management uh, continued growth, we would like to see better management there to manage that fleet. So that's the growth over time. You can see some of the new positions that I would anticipate over the next five years that we would need in public works. That's kind of the synopsis in two to three pages of some of the highlights. Be happy to answer any questions you might have about what public works feels like we'd need in the next five questions, years for operations. Yes, I do. Um, I noticed when you were talking about the uh, extra million dollars a year that it would take for five years to bring up the roads back to the five-year cycle. Is the million dollars a year a cap? In other words, is that the most work you could do? What if it were $2 million? I mean, could you do that much work to get it done faster? I would say yes. Let's take this year's chip seal um, to answer your question directly, Councilman Anderson. Um, yes, we'd be able to keep it with $2 million because that's outsourced. A good example is we've already, uh, you know, awarded the contract for it to start off July 1st. We're going to do 1.2 million. The contract will take anywhere from two to three weeks. To double that, we would the same inspector be able to manage that. Okay. And um, a, another good thing too is uh, even take this week, we've actually outsourced that uh, particular patching we may do. So the newer subdivisions don't take as much uh, pavement structure rebuilding, but some of the older areas of Prescott Valley do. But I think if it was a $2 million, we could uh, easily handle with existing staffing. Okay, so that's just conservative look. Yeah. Once again, by outsourcing, uh, we'd, just, we'd see a month-long contract to chip seal, and we might okay. hire a specialty paving to do a little more patching. In fact, uh, we've got plans of, uh, two weeks from now, we're going to have a contract to help our town crews that you've been seeing do it just with their own paver on some larger sections. So, yes, we could answer your question. Okay. Well, because in addition to public safety, clean water, and good sewer systems, I think roads are very important. We owe that to the town. So, you know, those are some areas we do need to look at. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Anything else, Norm? No, that's it, Mayor. Good job. Keep Thank it you. Up. Thank you so much. Okay, we move on then to number eight, presentation, library, five-year operational projection. Stuart, I see you brought all kinds of help to Yes, I want to acknowledge Charlotte Bradford, one of the trustees. The other one had to leave, but uh, they also received this document uh, about the five years. We were all excited. Casey and Ted and I, they got a little wild, and so that was good. They came up with some good ideas. We prioritized them, and the one thing that we currently have to address, even if there's no funding, we're going to need to do something about our our internet provider. 
Currently, we've had outages that will be daily and there'll be uh, several hours. And of course, this affects the public internet, which is used heavily. And, and people were starting to call, is your internet up? You know, if I'm at the desk, I'll say it, it is at the moment, but they could even come and, and then it would be down. And then on the staff side, that means the sorter, I'm correct, the sorter is now not operating in the back. And so that affects the service because things aren't checked in. Some things could get missed even when we get to do, to do that. So we are looking in the future to um, do CenturyLink. We've been working with Casey Danner and it is quite a bit more expensive. Um, we also will look at the possibility, uh, Casey, Danner, and I, and the uh, Yavapai County Library Director went to a, a library workshop on E-rate, and E-rate is a governmental refund for providing uh, electronic connectivity. And so, it, 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 early on, we've, all, we've known about E-Rate, but the, the paperwork was a, a, immense. They, they now have uh, lessened that, and the county has a, a um, what do you call it, a, not a counselor, a... Um, it's, what, it's somebody that helps you. Consultant. Consultant. I knew it was a C <laughs> word. And uh, so, so well, this is your entertainment. And so anyway... Um, we will then, that's a, there's a cycle, and that ended in March. So e even in the new budget year, we've got to make the step with changing that, and then we will try to get involved with that E-rate um, that e -rate refund. Um, we also, uh, the public internet printing and what we call QCI and GoPrint, those are also having some issues, and we've had those for years, but the local other libraries like at the college and Prescott Public, they use another company called Envisionware. I don't know if you have any comment about Envisionware. When I was at Glendale. Right you only use the microphone if you would. It's loud. I am loud. Uh, uh, Glendale uh, library system used Envisionware. And it was very popular. It was, very, it was truly self-serve where you didn't have to have a lot of interaction with staff. And that's good because it does free up another staff person to help with other you know, uh, helping patrons with readers advisory and finding materials or research. So Envisionware is truly self-serve and uh, a quality product. And then uh, lastly, uh, you know, we have a computer lab and before we moved in here, I was able to get a grant at that time to uh, uh, have the computers for the computer lab. They're now six years old. That's something else that we feel probably need. They're out of service. We probably need to deal with that, and that lab is used more and more now. We have this uh, volunteer that really has helped a lot, uh, helping people with just the basics, and there's usually always someone there, and then we use it, and then other uh, entities use it, so it is, it is something that's really used. Um, any questions on the technology part? Who, who is the current provider? I didn't know if I should uh, name names, but it's Cable One, and they've been in, in, over all these years. They really have been, but I think the the amount of usage that we 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 do have is probably just beyond. Now, when we were having these problems, we would talk to them, and they would talk about the fact that right at that moment they were running new lines and they were doing things. But but it, it's really affected our service, and we needed to address. That. Uh, now I'll go on to collections. I know you all know my song and dance for every meeting that we have had together that I talk about my concern about the collections. And so the um, trustees in the early 90s came before you and asked if that would be a possibility that every year a certain amount was added to that budget. And then unfortunately when percentages of the budget had to be cut, I had no choice. I had to cut that. And so currently all we get right now is the money from the Yavapai County Library District. And then of course we do have the general, gen, or donor, Claire Masowitz, who has uh, just, I think you all know, gave another $5,000, which is just tremendous. So that's something that we need to look at. We felt that was second is in priority. Any questions on the collections? Then we uh, went on to events, and currently the staff does a really good job. I think they provide lots of events, and they usually, well, most all the time, very limited funding, and sometimes, of course, they really work on getting the, the presenters at no cost. 
but they want to continue to do that. They want to increase the, the things they can do. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that was the other, uh, the next thing. This next one, or unless you have questions on events. The next one was one of the things I was concerned about. And um, I think you're aware that um, we added that one display case that's in the uh, other side of the mesh wall. We had display cases that were provided or part of the building, but they were on the second floor, somewhat removed. And so I, I used the last of the monies from that McBride and the Miranda estate to, it had to be custom made and it really worked well to fit along the wall there and I think that would be a great uh, thing to continue to run those across the whole wall. Um, and you're all aware about the black cement panels. Uh, one of the positive things, if there's anything about the roof leaking, I think that the architects also saw these black cement panels and were rather shocked at the condition and the, how they deteriorated. Some of the ones on the deck had already been replaced within this time period and they also have, you know, deteriorated. So we feel that would be another thing to do. The next one is the Trex, de Trex deck up on the, uh, the observation deck. And that's sort of peeling and dis disintegrating. Now I know Norm and his group, I don't know if he's here, I think they're going to try to turn them over, but I'm not sure. I just want to make sure um, that it's addressed in the future if possible. Um, this next one, I, there's several things that happened after we moved in here that I personally couldn't believe I didn't catch or the architects didn't catch, but we have no drinking fountain for the public on the second floor. I don't know exactly where I have an idea where it might work, but um, we just, you know, I get people, then I have to send them all the way downstairs. And the same with the children, they, they'd have to go downstairs. Um, and then on the, the, the uh, auditorium wall on the uh, inside here, you are, are aware there's the, the black lava rock, and that really has become kind of a problem. And so we, they, they had had more of it, and then they put the black, um, what was it, the black, um, not the lava, what am I looking at? Hmm? Flagstone. Yes, flagstone. the flagstone. 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 So any questions on some of the facilities thing? Mike. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to events because you mentioned in there the uh, you wanted a business friendly space and there wasn't a lot of information. What, what do you vision there? I believe we're talking about where were the magazines and what we're currently trying to do. Um, the staff started a new committee called the Feng Shui Committee and so and, and in that light, do you know uh, we, are, we have post our public information, it's like on the other side of the Friends store and the newspapers are over there and the magazines are over there. That space we're going to try to refit and pull out those ranges and try to make that more of a, a space for maybe not just business. That's the other thing we, we lacked in that size of room. We have the campsites that are right for four people. Crystal room, of course, is a different ball game. And so the genealogy room is used a lot for different kinds of meetings. And then the children's program room and is agreed, which uh, and I appreciate that because, you know, it, it is set up for the children, but we also, that's the kind of size rooms we need. So that's what we're looking at. Thanks. Um, I just want to say I appreciate that you're thinking forward. Um, there were a lot of people involved in the planning of this, so I don't think you have to take the blame for a missing fountain. It didn't occur to me either. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think it's highly critical. This is a jewel of this community, and we want it to remain a jewel. And if we don't take care of it, it will get pretty darn dull. And um, I just, I think we've had some shocks. Some of our materials did not perform as the manufacturer told us they would. And Larry and I had a conversation about that earlier. We'll, we'll deal with all of that, but it's progressive thinking and it's good housekeeping, and I thank you very much for all the detail. Well, I, I you know, want to give tours, and they, we still get the wow. I want you to know, and I know that it's something, even though we don't have an escalator, but that's the, we don't need to talk about that. Well, Larry told me today we finally got 
all of the materials in from Italy. Oh, the black cement. And my goodness, that took a long time. I've really had a lot of citizens complaining to me about the broken yes. panels. And I tell them, but we've ordered it from Europe, and we aren't in control of their time frame. And so I hope some of you will watch this out there, our citizens, and know they're here. We're going to deal with it. Right. And you know what? When they commented to me, it wasn't complaining. It was they wanted their jewel to still be polished. That's the way I feel. And as I say, when I do the tours, I try not to point it out. I'm not going to point it out. They, some of these people are in so, so awe that they, they don't probably notice what I notice because we live with this day to day. So, um, well, thank you. Anything else? We're going to go then to the staff. This was, I believe, Ted's. Uh, and uh, I think the time will come in the future. Um, we do, Sundays are probably going to need to be addressed. I know if I'm by here or up here, there's people in the parking lot. You know, we can post the hours and put them everywhere we might want to put them, but they'll still show up thinking that the library is open. And so, and with doing that same thing, then we were going to extend the Saturday hours. And so that, that part was the, um, the last section. And any questions for Casey? She's the, the DML um, person, of course, knows about the lab. And then um, she also has a lot of the technical abilities about the sorter and so on. I don't know. Do you have any comments, Casey? Comments, Casey? Mike, no. Mike, Mike, Mike. No, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> questions, anyone? Okay. We'll just take it all, and we'll be very happy to do that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, we move on into uh, number nine, presentations, human resources, five-year operational projection. Karen, and you got uh, Ryan to help you? Yes. My technical support. <laughs> I think you can pull that uh, microphone. Uh, Blind old grandmother. Down toward, toward you a little more, Karen. Sure, thank you. It's in English? That's good. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Well, as a matter of introduction, we know that we're here to talk about five-year plans for all of the operational areas at the town. Um, and our services, of course, not only internal, which is the majority of our customers are internal, but we also do have external customers. And we really wanted to focus on what are the service levels that will enhance or increase for us over the next five years in human resources. So as a matter of introduction, just to, uh, to recall that our services include uh, elements such as recruitment and workforce readiness, performance management and employee relations, organizational training and development f for all of our staff, benefits, wellness, and leave administration, safety, workers' compensation administration, job classification, and overall management of our compensation program. Within those services, it's really all driven by the number of our capital, human capital, in the organization. And I wanted to project for us at a global level throughout the town what we might expect in growth over the next five years. I know each department is looking at their own individual needs, but I started on the premise of I just wanted to, to look at what if we use that assumption of where we are today with five to six FTEs per 1,000 uh, in population with our citizens and carry that out through the five years. And so that's the first graph that you see there on page one to be able to show that today uh, this 
this year we added 10 positions, 10 FTEs. We're at 237 employees or FTEs. And through that five-year plan, carrying out that assumption, we would be looking at basically 305 uh, to 315 employees. Uh, and that represents an overall growth of the 67 to 75 employees. Uh, the third line is a little bit of a variation, but basically that 10 that we added this year, you're looking at 10 to 12 next year and adding one additional thereafter. After I finished that assumption, I did go back then and look at each department's individual plans that they're presenting to you, added up all their staffing requests, and that's where my number at 67 to their number uh, was 75. So we were pretty close into that uh, realm if our population projections are correct. I then wanted to add some average costing to you. I'm sure you've heard a lot of different costs from each individual department, but in a snapshot, what I did for us was consider five new police officers each year. I think the Chief's presentation this evening is actually going to suggest seven. Uh, each new police officer costs us about $75,000 at a higher with their base salary and their benefits. So I used that figure as well as then for all other employees added in the uh, additions throughout the five-year plan, I based it on our actual median salary today. So from our laborer through our town manager, right in the middle, where are the majority of our employees in salary, and it's right about $48,000. So those are the figures that I use in calculating our projected average costs with these staffing increases. So, uh, so you'll see that basically um, 850000 to $1.2 million over the next five years on an annual basis. For human resources, uh, with our external customer contacts increasing with recruitment activities, uh, employment verification, public records requests, and so forth, uh, with the community growing, we also feel that to, in order to maintain our customer service levels, that there will be some staffing adjustments that we would project over the next five years in, in two areas. And that's what I show here, that we currently have three full-time employees and one part-time employee. Next year, I would like to look at uh, reclassifying our administrative support position. It is presently a part-time, 22-hour position as an administrative aide, which is the first level of our four-part four series in the administration support uh, career path. Uh, we would like to consider moving it to our administrative assistant level and moving it to a full-time position. We continue to grow in our technology, and with that, uh, we have more than A through Z paper filing uh, that an aide oftentimes provides to us, but there's a lot more expertise that we're now calling upon in that support position with all the various different databases that we have to manage and call upon that person to assist us with. So that's why we would be looking at moving them to a assistant level and our workload seems like we continually struggle, and so a full-time position would be greatly beneficial to us at a cost of approximately $29,000 a year. The second would be uh, further out in potentially fiscal year uh, 1920, four, five years out, uh, that I would be interested in looking at an HR or a benefits manager for us. As we continue through my presentation, you'll hear the need in retention regarding benefits plan administration. It becomes more complex as we go from year to year, uh, and maintaining that is so important and growing that to become a very attractive employer and for retention purposes. Our broker may very well retire in the next few years. Uh, if we hire a benefits manager at four or five years out, your HR director will be retiring in four or five years after that. And so this would allow us to have someone in office between the manager and the director in my absences, as well as for succession planning to prepare an internal candidate to assist you with any transition with my own retirement. Yes, I'm planning for my retirement 10 years out. I'm giving you officially my 10-year notice. <laughs> it's like that commercial, isn't it? I love that. I'm serving you my 15-year notice. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, so with operational uh, and services that are needed, I really have just uh, five areas that I wanted to touch base with you this evening. 
uh, and they're all in, wrapped around the need for retention, revolving around that. Uh, we want to be a preferred employer. I know that we do. And we are to a degree, and we want to maintain that and continue to grow that so we can attract and retain high-quality uh, caliber individuals to join our team and retain them as well as the employees that we currently have. Retention uh, is key to our uh, successes, I believe, over the next five years. And so with that, some elements to actually aid us in our retention efforts. First, I would like to uh, suggest the Winter Gala. I know we had a, su a huge success with our volunteer banquet uh, just a few weeks ago or a month ago now. Town management also suggested perhaps uh, restoring the Winter Gala. I would love to support that. Uh, Human Resources has provided those uh, planning in that event in the past. We would do that again in the future. Uh, we are ready to tackle that next year if the council uh, and staff are agreeable to do so. We would love to uh, take on that project and anticipate that would be a five to $7,000 cost on an annual basis. Second is training and development. You know, we actually have a dedicated policy in our personnel manual regarding training and development where we as a town say that we're committed to providing training and development opportunity to our employees and that we, we regard the personal and professional development of our employees as an important part of our organizational mission. And with that, I would suggest that we need to look at two things to restore over the next five years as we continue to grow and want to, uh, again, attract uh, individuals to come join our organization and to retain those that are here. And that would be, first of all, A, uh, look at our technical training and our professional certifications and restore training dollars to each of the departments so that they can provide uh, unique training to that field and area of expertise in their own departments at approximately $24,000 a year across all departments for that cost. Uh, second, one of the things I hear constantly from our employees is when are we going to be able to restore educational tuition reimbursement. And I feel that is a, 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 a next step for us in our benefit plan and packaging to be competitive and to provide uh, real value to our employees of our dedication in their professional development. I gave you the high number here. It could be as low as 50000 uh, but up to 175000 a year based on uh, the, uh, the policy as it was written today and the amount of reimbursement that we provide to employees at the associate, bachelor's, or master degree level programs. And then last, oh, well not last, third, health and wellness. Excuse me. Health and wellness. It has, today was a great day. Uh, Marty uh, can attest to it. We had over 110 people at the health fair. And so that was exciting to us. We have continued to grow and show uh, our, our wellness program. I know that you're committed to it and that you, we all realize that not only does it reduce turnover because, again, it's showing value and care for our employees, but it actually helps us with other things such as reducing absenteeism, uh, personal illness and injuries, and therefore reducing our health care costs, worker compensation losses, and disability-related costs, as well as, again, overall improving employee engagement and workplace productivity. Uh, we have now had for uh, last year and again this next year $25,000 added to the HR budget for our participation incentive to date and we're going through June the 15th yet, but today we've had 75 employees take advantage of that incentive program, which is excellent. I would suggest that we need to continue uh, to grow in this area for our retention purposes uh, with an additional $10,000 annually starting next year so that we can expand our education opportunities and our wellness activity or accessibility of wellness in the workplace for employees. And now last, benefit plan design. Uh, we saw this year we had some uh, impact to our health plan costs. Uh, we were at a 2.6% increase over X number of years. Projecting that out as well as adding in our 67 to 75 additional employees and the cost in and of itself that that would incur, we are looking at 3.5 to $4.8 million 
uh, in additional health care costs over the next five years. I heard uh, town clerk's office talk about, you know, consideration over the next five years of self-funding for our risk management program. I too am interested in considering and at least exploring the opportunity for self-funded management of our health care as well as worker compensation plans. This will help us to uh, better manage the cost and gain control over our premiums. And it is something that we would like to explore over the next five years. These are reasons, again, why with um, our broker and benefits manager being added, we would be able to tackle those kind of projects. And then the last slide for you this evening uh, is in the realm of technology. Uh, we would like to consider uh, by the year 1718 having all personnel records from hire to separation managed in an electronic format through LaserFish. We're well underway with that. We have uh, moved to um, Last year, we purchased a high-efficiency all-in-one copy machine that will provide us the scanning abilities that we need to go directly into LaserFish. We also um, went electronic with our job applications, our background process, performance evaluations. We're currently uh, implementing an onboard program. Uh, that's the name of the software tool through NeoGov that will elect uh, make our management of new hire paperwork electronic, such as our I-9s and our tax forms, W-4s and so forth. And so these are all steps to get us there. We are, we are going to get close here. If our admin support is made full-time, that would really help us uh, get four or five big file drawers all cleaned out, scanned, and coded into LaserFish that, so that we were truly electronic in all personnel record management. That would be our goal Tech, with technology over the next five years, uh, targeting 1718 as an implementation. Startup cost projected around $12,000 and then $1,000 annually thereafter as we're bringing in employees to add them with their electronic images and, and um, identifications. So in total, for human resources operations, the tuition reimbursement, um, those operational recommendations, the staffing requests that I presented this evening, we're looking at about $290,000 in operational costs. Also, uh, remember I mentioned department training uh, at $24,000. Our benefits in healthcare administration, 3.5 to 4.8 million, and then compensation for those 67 to 75 new positions, 850 to 1.2 million annually. So that's what we see happening in the next five years. What are your concerns, questions, or comments? Questions, anyone? Mike? Yeah, I was interested in your uh, tuition reimbursement. Yes, sir. Uh, I assume that's a, a well-regarded, I guess, benefit among employees. And I was just wondering, mm -hmm. how did you come up with uh, estimating that figure as far as reimbursement? Yes, I looked at, uh, uh, and I apologize, I could have brought it with me or shared it as an attachment. We actually do have a personnel policy that shows how much that we provide at that associate, bachelor's, and master's degree level. Those, those figures, of course, could certainly be readjusted or, you know, what have you. But uh, based on those figures, I took percentages of employees to come up with that costing. What was, what was that, do you know? You know, I did not bring back uh, my details. Probably in total, uh, maybe about 17 percent. Yeah, with uh, you know higher number at the associate, and um, then a little bit smaller for bachelor, and a little smaller for masters. Mm -hmm. You know, it is also interesting to note that in the last two years, the police department has revised all of their job descriptions. We did not have higher education in our job descriptions for many of, uh, of the positions at the police department, and that has changed. And so while we're requiring or encouraging that higher education as they move through the chain of command ranks, it would be an amazing thing to be able to support them financially to obtain those credentials and be ready for that additional responsibility. Other question, Laura? I don't really have a question. I just wanted to tell you that um, I can only speak for myself, of course, but we're behind the curve in all of this, and you're having to play catch up, and it wasn't by choice. And we have had a turnaround in the 
overall economy, and I think we're a little more fortunate here in our community than others. And so for us to move forward and be progressive in this planning is very encouraging because if you don't plan it, it won't happen. Very, very much so. In the next five years, if we have the additional resources in a, a benefits manager, I would also like to do a needs assessment on some of our benefit plans, such as, uh, and I've noted them in my report, but dental. Uh, there is a lot of out-of-pocket expense on dental for our employees. There's a lot of out-of-pocket expense on our vision plan as well, our retirement health savings account. Uh, we uh, are still short from where we were uh, prior to the recession, we haven't restored that full amount yet to them, and we're one percent behind yet on that. So, yeah, those are things that we could definitely work at. Marty, yeah, by uh, implementing a lot of these programs and uh, uh, incentives to the employees, uh, how much will okay? How much will be the the cost be compared to saving on turnover? Because I know when you have a large turnover. Uh, there are certain costs in retraining people and breaking them in and all that. So what would be the, you know, how much we spend as opposed to how much we save based on uh, reducing the turnover? That's a very good question, Marty. Uh, the, the, the short answer and the best way to be able to see it quickly in a picture in our heads is that turnover basically costs us one and a half times the position's annual salary because of that training, that onboarding, that recruitment, that loss in productivity while they're learning and so forth. It's basically, again, one and a half times their annual salary. So in the report where we actually know today our uh, median salary for employees is 48,000. Let's just round it up and say 50,000. Turnover for one employee basically costs us $75,000. And uh, we have been uh, losing probably about three to five employees a month presently. So multiply that 75,000 times five employees. Police officer position we know is $75,000. So that time and a half of that and uh, the amount of turnover. So turnover is very expensive. Anything we can do to combat that is going to be a savings, not a cost. Any other uh, questions? Anything else, Karen? No, thank you for your time. It's a big one. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank okay. you. Okay, with that, uh, we move on to number 10. Presentation, please, five-year operational uh, projections and chief gave us a pretty good book on it I didn't take mine with me but I... uh, mr. mayor um, if I could I don't know that there's any purpose in going through the next two items because there's no money left <laughs> chief might as well forget it it's nice seeing you all tonight Come well, I don't there. have a PowerPoint presentation, but um, everybody saw the report. I try to include a lot of graphs and pictures because if you're well like done, me, you need way. pictures to, to understand things. Um, and I'll try to make this as quick as I, as I can because I know everybody wants to hear what Ivan has to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, uh, you've had the report for a week or so now. It's pretty self-explanatory. I, I will... Uh, obviously be open to questions at the end. I just wanted to go over some highlights. So what we did was we looked at the past five years to try to predict the, the future five years. Predicting crime is, is a very difficult thing. I don't have a crystal ball, and if anybody comes up with the surefire way of predicting it, I'd love to meet them because uh, make my job a lot easier. So what we have to do is look at trends and projections, and so we looked at the past five years. Over the past five years, crime, uh, part one crime has been up 30 percent. Now, part two crime has been down overall, but more concerning, domestic violence and assault, which are considered in the class two, are up 26 percent. In fact, um, unfortunately, Prescott Valley leads Yavapai County in sheer numbers when it comes to domestic violence. Our daily activity for our officers is up 24 percent. And what's interesting to know on that is that our calls for service have remained fairly constant. So that increased activity is actually our officers trying to get out and do more, as uh, you'll see in a second. But our arrests are up 6 percent compared to 2010. And if you look at just last year, they're up 11 percent this year. 
that increase is concerning because it's, it means that the things that we are going out on aren't simply minor infractions or nuisance calls. They're, they're criminal, it's criminal activity that's resulting in arrests. Uh, our traffic enforcement by our officers is up about 78% with the elimination of photo enforcement. And yet we still have seen an 8% increase in injury and fatal accidents. So we, still ha we, need, we need to make a better effort at doing that. And part of our projections for the coming five years is to uh, increase and basically build back up our traffic enforcement units. So for the next five years, what we're forecasting is another 23% increase in calls for service. So that's going to be uh, going from about 23,380 calls a year to about 28,000. That's an increase of about 15 calls a day on average. The, uh, the thing we have to remember on those, though, is the, the types of calls that we're getting are more involved and they're more complex. So 15 more calls per day on average uh, and, and higher, uh, more sever severity of crimes means uh, that we're going to be taking longer. We're anticipating a 19% increase in Part 1 crime and another 27% increase in the Part 2 crimes, as well as a 15% increase in accidents. So I'm glad that Karen was here earlier uh, and to talk about the staffing projections, because when we sent her our, our report, she came back and said that we were actually pretty close in our future projections, which was nice to know. So what we're looking at is proposing an increase in our staffing over the next five years, an incremental increase that would uh, total about 131 total employees in, 2000, in 2020. Uh, that would include 104 sworn officers, which is a ratio of two officers per 1,000 residents. Um, this would allow us to have a significant presence throughout the community in areas such as our schools, our businesses, our neighborhoods, get back involved in our community watch programs. Uh, it would allow us to target our problem areas of the town and also increase our traffic enforcement. Now, I can't stress enough the importance of being able to get out and getting involved in these strong community outreach programs, which we have not been able to do a lot of in the past uh, couple of years. Policing, community policing models across the country continue to show that these efforts do result in safer, more appealing communities for both residents and businesses, both current and future. And due to the uh, rapid growth that we've seen here in Prescott Valley, my officers just simply don't have the time to practice effective community outreach efforts. And I'll give you a good example. I, I attended the um, FBI National Academy Associates retraining down in Oro Valley this year. And Oro Valley is um, very similar to Prescott Valley, and it's a suburb of Tucson. So it has any uh, spillover that they may have from that, uh, from that fact. But they're about um, 41 to 42,000 as of two thir 2013. They have a 2.43 ratio of officers to their population. And what that allows them to do is they have officers in every one of their schools, their middle schools, their high schools. Um, their crime rates are, are really low, and they're able to get out into the community and make a difference. And that's, that's what we would like to do. Now, we can simply continue our current staffing projection or curve and keep it low, but we are going to have a department that simply responds to things. And if that's, but I don't think that's what a community wants. It's, I know it's not what I want, but that's where we go without that extra staffing. The other level of, uh, or the other area of concern that I wanted to talk about, and I did address it in the report, uh, was overtime. And I, I think that this, this topic has to be addressed in a, in a responsible way that's going to accomplish a couple of things. Number one, a realistic budget that will allow us to serve the community's needs, but allow me to also properly manage that budget. It's going to allow me to focus in other areas of the department that need my attention, and it's going to reduce the high compensatory time balances that we have in the town, and the town is going to have to pay for those sooner or later. And the problem is a lot of our compensatory banks are earned at a certain wage. And if, they, uh, if somebody leaves and they, they um, retire or separate from service, we owe them that, time, uh, that compensatory time. And it's paid out at whatever rate they're, they're earning at that time. Um, and also it would allow us to reduce our general leave balances to more manageable levels. So let me give you an example. Right now I have 76 current employees as of today. The report on comp and general leave, 40% of my department is over the limit on their general leave. 22% of the department is over the limit on their compensatory time. Now starting next year, we've been on a five-year plan to reduce our compensatory time bank balances. And so this year it's 140 hours starting next year, which is in another month, 
it's 120 hours. So in less than a month, 33% of my department will be over the maximum if everything else stays the same right now when it comes to compensatory time. So I stand before you tonight and I readily admit that there is a need to reduce the overtime work by this department and to manage it better, and I accept that responsibility. But the actual overtime liability over a six-year average showed that we're at about $300,000 in overtime liability, and my budget is $52,000. So I submit to you that the realistic manageable amount is somewhere in between those two numbers. And at that, um, I will answer any questions that you might have. Questions? Anyone? Uh, Rick? You talk about the difference between the realistic overtime dollars and the budgeted overtime dollars. Where does the extra overtime dollars come from? How is it paid? In other words, it, does that come out of your overall general budget? Yes. So if I have, for example, any uh, staffing sh vacancies throughout the year, then it's, it's, that's used to balance the budget. So even with, um, well, actually, I put a moratorium on paid overtime, um, what was it, John, about a month ago? Uh, because we were, we were over our overtime budget then, our paid overtime budget, and I didn't want to go over it anymore, so we put a moratorium on paid overtime, so it's back to comp. For the, the things so that the, need to be worked, so, so the, the comp fact, bank balances are going back up. So again. the fact that you're not, I don't want to say getting as much money for overtime as you should, we'll just throw that out there that way. I'll just say it that way, um, is bound to be taking money from something else that correct the department could be doing. Right. Okay. So, for example, right now, um, my last report that I got from my administrative assistant was we were 92% through the year. I am 90% expended on my budget. So it's, you know, I'm real close, and I, I obviously don't want to go over my budget. And I think that there's a way that we can do this, and I, I, I want to do it. I, I, I do recognize that there's a need to, to start managing the budget. But with the responsibilities of law enforcement, we have to go out and we, we have to respond to things. We don't have the ability to, to say it's 5 o'clock. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, hopefully just put a pressure point and stop the bleeding and we'll be back. I, I can't do that. Um, I, I was talking to somebody the other day and I gave him the example. I said, we make the effort right now. If somebody does something on their first or second day within their work week and they get up, held over or something for, for whatever the need is, at the end of the week when they have an opportunity and we can let them go uh, early to keep them within the 40 hours, we're doing those things. But at the same time when we do that, then we now create a staffing shortage in some cases that we have to be very careful about. That's a gamble. Um, but the other problem is if that same incident occurs on their last day of the work week, right. there is no uh, opportunity to send them home early. Leave so home. there are uh, times when it's absolutely necessary and, and uh, it has to be done because we're a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week operation, and we're reactionary. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, we just had this uh, conversation and it's been going on with Partners Against Narcotics Trafficking and their budget. And they have nine people in a $180,000 overtime budget, which most of the people on the board finally came to the realization that that's not responsible because most of the things that they do are, are planned. And when you have the opportunity to plan your activities, then there should be no overtime. That's not... In our, that's not our case. We don't have that luxury. The second question that I have then is on the excess compensatory time. How do you fix that? I mean, if you're going to have 33% of your people with excess time, what would be a fix for that? Well, that's why we have to come to a, a, a prudent and reasonable number for the paid overtime because the, the hours are going to get worked one way or another. So I think my, uh, it's in the report, I think the uh, six-year average, which is all I could uh, find when I went back, was like 6,400 hours of overtime worked a year. Now, again, I, I admit that that needs to be managed and it needs to be reduced. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. I, I, I'm there with that. But um, I can tell you, I don't know what 52,000 average is out to on an hourly rate, but um, it's, it's not going to be enough. So we have to get a median so that once we hit that 52,000, and actually we're over it right now, um, that I don't have to do this moratorium and say, okay, now everybody has to take comp for w uh, any legitimate overtime worked, because then those banks go back up and we're back in the same boat. Right. 
and at the same time, guys are, are trying to get time off, but then that creates staffing shortages. It's just it's a vicious cycle. And when you have staffing shortages, somebody else has to work overtime to cover it. Yes. So while you're correcting one person's overtime, you're paying for it with We're another person. We're increasing someone else's. Thank you. Yeah. Laura? Yeah, if, if I might comment on that, Mayor. Uh, Brian and I have talked about this uh, uh, for a long time. And I have done the same with every chief we've had for the 10 years that, uh, that I've been in this seat. Um, this is a nationwide issue, uh, nationwide in that the management of overtime and comp time by police departments and every department is an ongoing challenge. Okay, and so there are balances that you end up uh, striking and working with. And um, management of personnel is, uh, is always a challenge for the department head. And it can be done. It is being done. And uh, hats off to Brian for going ahead and realizing, you know, when somebody has to work till midnight out on an accident or one of those unexpected uh, issues, that means that at the end of the work week, that person may not be working eight hours on Friday, for example. That person sent home so that you're not accruing the overtime. And it, it's, a, it's always a struggle, and there is a, a break-even point, and you are addressing that uh, to the largest extent possible this year by adding five more sworn personnel to the department. Because at the end of the day, it is a question of manpower. Now, what our challenge is going to be is with new officers coming on board this year and then hopefully next year if the economy keeps rolling, uh, that we don't go ahead and raise our minimum staffing level, okay, which I believe is now five per shift uh, out on the streets, that when we get new officers, we take these new officers and use them to buy down the comp time so people can go out and get the vacations they need to go burn that rather than increasing the minimum staffing level. And so I have all the confidence in the world that Brian will be able to do that to get the comp uh, numbers down and the leave numbers down through the utilization of these five new employees that you've got coming in. I just would like to address two things real quick. Um, I agree with uh, Mr. Tukowski. It is a national issue. In fact, I was looking at something today on the Internet, uh, doing some research for uh, SWAT schools, and one of the things that this article was talking about was that the compensation for SWAT officers that are generally, they're, they're more senior officers, they have more experience, and they get compensated. And one of the lines in there was they get to enjoy, I forget how it was worded, um, generous overtime. And when I see those kinds of things, it just it makes my, my it makes me bristle. I swear, I, I don't. Be, just because we are entrusted with the public's money, doesn't mean that we have to spend it. And where I came from in Michigan, we had a 1.6 million dollar overtime budget, and we exceeded it every year because there was a sense of entitlement that everybody got to have it. And it's always bothered me always bothered me. And when I have always tried in the past to introduce responsible measures to control overtime, in the past I've been rebuffed, and that, that's fine. You know, if they wanted to spend their $1.6 million, they did. I don't think that that's responsible, and I, and I won't do that here. But what we need to do is, is come up with something that is more realistic, to be quite honest. The second thing I wanted to address is the minimum staffing. We, we do establish our minimum staffings, but it's, as our population increases, as our calls for service volume increases, we will look at obviously having to adjust our minimums because um, right now on days and graveyards it's five, and on our swing shift it's six. I believe that's correct. And so as our, um, as our calls for service were to increase and uh, our population increases, we may have to um, adjust those numbers up or, or, or down a little bit, depending on what happens. So I just wanted to make sure we're clear on that. you have a comment, Laura? I, I have a question, and it's a really bizarre, way out of the box question. Larry will answer it. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we watch the events in Baltimore and New York, those events are affecting crime statistics that we all have to deal with out there in the future. Now, I relation 
realize that our population densities don't fall, you know, in that category. But we do have people concerned about costs of insurance and all kinds of things. Do you foresee off in the future that we're going to be affected by any of this horrific change and an increase in crime statistical data? Because that's what insurance companies and everybody else look at. Um, well, I, I think the answer again lies in, in my staffing uh, proposals. The, the better effort we make at getting out and working with our business community and our residential community and our schools, it keeps it, it it's, it's been shown, it's a safer community in general. Right. So we can try to keep things down that way. Second thing is one of the things that just occurred in Baltimore was um, with the indictment and the charging of the six officers involved in that incident, the other officers basically threw their hands up and said, well, well I'm not doing anything. And so now they're sitting back. Now they're seeing um, homicide rates just skyrocketing because it's almost like... What uh, I'm referencing. Yeah, it's almost like the movie uh, RoboCop when Detroit police went on strike and everybody was just ravaging the town. I mean, that's kind of what they're doing in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I don't see that kind of thing here. I think we have a really, really good rapport with our community. No, I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about the stat stats that are being created that are off the chart that could affect us later on with insurance rates and all that kind of thing. Will it trickle down to this size of a community? I don't know. I, National it, crime statistics. Uh, Councilman Nye, I think what you're going to see is that to insure a vehicle in some urban areas is going to be very expensive. That is the case today in the community south of where Brian came from. It has the highest insurance rate in the country right. uh, yeah. for just the reasons that, that you reference. The one beautiful thing that we've got going on in Prescott Valley is that this community really supports its police department. And because of that very good support and the love goes both ways, the department in turn does a very good job of protecting the community, you don't end up seeing things uh, uh, a community breakdown and actually go towards anarchy and you are seeing that in the United States today in certain communities. Well, I, I agree with everything you said and support it, but I'm worried about future budgets that we might, this may affect them so but I think insurance rates are, are um, um, determined by crime and those kinds of things. So a good example, and Mr. Collins, he brings it up. Um, the insurance, auto insurance and homeowners insurance rates, for that matter, in the city of Detroit are just ridiculous. Right. Southfield, where I came from back in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, was second in the state, not per capita, but in sheer numbers of stolen cars. So to insure a car, if you lived in Southfield, you were paying almost as much as you would have been if you were living in the city of Detroit. The difference was that in Southfield we had enough staffing that we could direct our efforts at community efforts to educate people about keeping their cars safe and have directed patrols where the, the thefts were occurring so that we could um, significantly reduce that, and we did significantly reduce it over the coming years. I guess I, I'm just worrying about yeah. how you're going to manage future budgets if this indeed trickles down. Right. I think the, the, I'm not worried about the quality that you're providing this community. Right. Not one minute do I am I concerned about that. But I think that's what's going to drive the insurance rates and things like that is the perception of the safety of the community, by and large. Rick, you had a comment. Well, yeah, I'm I I am concerned about budget and, and ongoing budget issues, and I don't want to sound like I'm trying to micromanage. That's not what I want at all but I'm concerned about information and maybe Larry there's some way we could you and I and perhaps the chief every 90 days maybe take a look at this that so we could get together you know during the day sometime and and look at how things are going with this and where we stand with it and and what we're able to do I think I would feel better about it and I'd be glad to report back then to the council yeah, absolutely, uh, and that would see, also allow me to. This maybe... is this is an issue where it it hits our town budget very hard. You know, the police department is a very large portion of our budget, 
Yes, and I, I want to see that it that it's dealt with correctly. Yeah, and, and I I can uh, certainly uh, set up a time where we can sit down and go through this. I would submit to you that what you're seeing is a five-year plan. I would submit to you that today it is working. Today we're co we're coming to the end within two two and a half three weeks of a budget that was even tighter than the one Brian is looking at for next year. Okay, it's worked. And a good police chief, and we have one, and a great department, we have one, is able to move their operational budgets around to meet those contingencies. And I would submit to you that the department has done a better job this year of managing overtime, managing comp, managing the deployment of resources than they did the previous year because Brian was still getting uh, his feet underneath him understanding the budgeting process. I would submit to you going forward that what Brian is laying out in front of you is a situation that will help accommodate a community that will end up being 55,000 people and he's laying out a, a very good plan that in the event we have additional revenues and even think about increasing revenues that he will have not only the best department in northern arizona but we one do. that might be even the best in the state working in that direction okay now having said that if we see a downturn in the economy it, that will negatively impact the five-year projections all of the department heads have made, all bets are off. Okay, but this is a great plan going forward, uh, much better than one that was being talked about uh, four or five months ago about a massive influx of officers this year. We couldn't afford it. Sorry, just couldn't happen. Okay, this is a reasonable plan moving forward. Uh, <laughs> If the money's available, Sim similar to the street department, if you want to see a four-year rotation on street maintenance, we need a lot more money. Okay, uh, Norm's uh, appetite for uh, resources seriously outstripped the police departments because his toys are much more expensive. Well, yeah, I. Just, just one more comment. I, I agree, and I think that's, from what we've seen about the five-year plans, I think that's a discussion we do need to have about e extra revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's something we're going to have to take a good close look at because we're going to need that increased revenue, and there must be a, a source for it. So we need to look at that. Yeah, I, I threw some numbers together, too, like uh, building off of what Karen was doing, the, the staffing increases that we're looking at by 2020. Um, projecting out a 3% a year, which is, I know, generous, but just as a projection, uh, would be about $3.46 million in 2020 additional over what we have right now, which is about a 50, I'm sorry? Uh, 3.46 million. So basically between now and um, um, 2020, I, I forget how many people I said. 20, 131 total employees, and right now we have 96 total employees, so 35, 35 total employees. Uh, at a, uh, so it would run about 3.46, and I think that's pretty much in line with what Karen was saying, uh, what her projection. Mine might be a little higher because I have a little bit more, but we're real close. Any other questions, comments? I'm done. Anything else, Chief? No, nice to see you again, Mary. By the way, that was a good report you put out. I did Sorry? read it, believe it or not. What's that? I said it was a good report you put out. I, re I did oh. read it, believe it or not. Five year plan. Oh, good. Sure everybody you. else has, too. Thank you. I, I will have to tell you that um, James Edelstein and, and my staff did most of the work on compiling that, and I just helped format it and things like that. But they did most of the, the heavy lifting on it. And without, without my staff, they, I mean, they're just phenomenal. Without them, there's no way I could be anywhere near successful at this job. Well, I've got some super people, so I sure do. keep it up. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, we move on to one I know we've all been waiting for. <laughs> you know, Mayor, Mayor, Five Council. Five-year operational expa pro uh, projection legal. You know, I'd like to get a little uh, credit for the fact that normally you're getting after me for the amount that I write 
and speak. Is that is that not correct? You kind of absolutely. think that not even, a few more necessary. words than are absolutely necessary. Not even, even what more. department has given you the shortest five-year projection? Oh, that's true. You're, you're a man of very few words. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And and in fact, uh, you know, the legal department uh, is is somewhat unique in the fact that uh, we have two divisions: one being the the criminal division, and the other being the civil division. And the criminal division, a lot like the police department, has a daily grind. You know, they have things they have to do. Uh, and as we have more people or more events or more crime, um, Bob is down there in the pretrial conferences, and we've got cases just coming around, and, and uh, they have to be done. They absolutely have to be done. And Bob is one of the best prosecutors there is. And he works with Irma, who brings those cases in, and then Cindy uh, helps him. And, um, and then we have uh, Susan, who is our part-timer, who helps Cindy. And uh, those four people, day in, day out, uh, have a lot to do, and they've got to do it. And if we have more cases, they have to take care of those more cases. The civil side, we just kind of sit around, our feet up on the desk, you know. <laughs> Stephen, are you listening? I, Stephen and I are the are the civil side with uh, part-time Carol. You know, our our part-time uh, paralegal. We have a little more flexibility uh, because civil things you do kind of get a, a big push, a big rush every once in a while. Um, but other times, and and if that happens, then we push certain projects into the future, and we hit the things that are most important. And so we're able to kind of keep things on an even keel in doing that. And if we really get a, a bind, then of course we contract it out. We contract out, as you know, most of the uh, defense of our civil cases. For example, we manage outside counsel as opposed to staffing up to deal with the big cases as they come in. So the only thing that we've projected in five years is that we're, we're confident we're going to need another prosecutor in that criminal side. And uh, that will be, that'll be a, a new one or an additional one. It'll be an additional one. So hopefully we'll keep Bob there, and uh, he'll be training another uh, prosecutor. And so that'll be five people that will be trying to keep the criminal cases uh, moving along in the pipeline. We're confident that we can we can keep the department running in the next five years with just that additional person. We do worry a little bit about something that's on the horizon, and that's uh, body-worn video. We're learning, as everybody is jumping on that bandwagon, that the purchase of the uh, uh, e e even uh, the uh, cameras and the software and, and uh, the, you know, the cloud services and all of that, that's not the only cost because uh, every department suddenly gets involved, or at least large numbers of them do. Certainly the prosecutors get involved because they have so much more that they've got to disclose. And uh, there are many more public records requests as a result. And we get involved with the clerk's office and the PD in terms of those public records requests. And then, of course, uh, in civil litigation, uh, that becomes part of what has to be disclosed in civil litigation. And you've just got this tremendous amount of, uh, of data that you have to store and categorize. And um, uh, if, if you have people who want to see it, then you've got to block out the faces of children. And you've got to block out, perhaps, the faces of victims and all kinds of things. And the software just is, hasn't caught up yet with what is coming down the pipe. So it's, a, it's turning out to be a tremendous cost that people just really didn't anticipate uh, in terms of how to handle all of that data that suddenly is there and people want to see and want to be able to see it right away. We've not anticipated putting on new staff for that. Frankly, we expect that staff to end up in the police department over in the clerk's office or someplace else. But... Uh, Whatever happens, we'll find a way to make it work uh, if, we, if we need to. Um, there's so much uncertainty, we just aren't sure even what to suggest yet in terms of five years from now. So, that's it. Questions, anyone? Ivan, I think 
every one of us agree your department is doing a super job. Thanks. And actually, the truth is, every department has really worked at this. And uh, I've been in this business since, I don't know what, the 80s, I guess. And what a change. It's not, a, not simple, and uh, everything has changed drastically. Larry lost all of his hair. That's oh. one of the things that happens. It's our fault. He hasn't lost it all. There's still some. I, I think that's that, what's that, Rogaine? I, I don't know. I, I better be careful. I might be slandering him. But. Are you rubbing it in or rubbing it on? I, I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, commotions, promotions? If there is none, we have one more that everybody hates, and that's... And then we have a special meeting. Mike says no. <laughs> meeting is adjourned. Well, now we're uh, going to go into the next meeting. And I understand from Diane that we can't uh, put our... Uh, just stay logged on, Mayor and Council, if you would, please. Uh, Thank you. And uh, just give me a second, council. and I'll switch over to the other.